This is something brand new, right? You go and do a record deal, you're collateralizing your record royalties. You go and do a publishing deal, you're collateralizing your songwriter royalties. You go and do a tour promotion deal, uh, you're collateralizing your concert royalties. This is a brand new category. And that category is super exciting because artists have simply never had the ability to make this customer offering or fan offering uh, to, to their fans. And the fans suddenly have a vehicle through which they get to come along for the ride with the, with the artist. That is incredibly exciting. It's something that... Well, welcome back to the NFT Now podcast. Very excited to have you all here. This week, we have an incredibly special lineup of guests. We have the founding team of One Of. One Of is an NFT platform built for the music community to connect fans and collectors at all levels with their favorite artists. Um, the, the founding team are an incredibly seasoned group of entrepreneurs that have operated at the highest levels in media, music, entertainment, and technology. On the, today's episode, we have Lynn Dye, the co-founder and CEO. We have Josh James, the COO and co-founder. Then we have Adam Fell, who's the co-founder and board member of One Of, and also the president of Quincy Jones Productions. Quincy Jones is a major partner in this endeavor. Um, and One Of has been incredibly uh, proactive in, in securing different partnerships with some of the leading players in the music industry. Just this week, they're rolling out new features, a secondary sales marketplace. They're doing their drop with Doja Cat, who's one of the world's biggest artists at the moment and for, for many months and years to come, likely. Um, I think what they're setting out to do is that they're setting to tackle a bunch of interesting problems that the space faces. I think um, there's some sustainability issues in the space. So they, they talk a little bit about how they have uh, are, are trying to make this a much more green and sustainable endeavor, right? I think a lot of NFTs have been... Um, uh, it, it can be challenging to the average consumer, but one of is really trying to streamline this entire process. You, you can pay via fiat with your credit card. You can, uh, they, they really want to cater to the, the broad mainstream fan market that may have never, uh, may hold zero crypto whatsoever. Um, and then lastly, they, they really just want to, to help innovate on how NFTs can operate in the music space. I, at one point, we talk about how this could very well become one of the biggest revenue streams in the, the different revenue portfolio of artists, right? I think it's still very much in the early stages of that happening. But as the market matures, um, it's it's not out of the question for that to happen. So I think getting to better understand how one of works, some of the, the core updates and the, the vision that they have for their product roadmap, and ultimately how they're really setting out to uplift artists, their communities and fans, and, and just kind of make a positive impact in the world of music is, is very, very exciting. So without any further ado, we're going to welcome on Lynn uh, Lynn Dye, Josh James, and Adam Fell, alongside my co-host and co-founder, Matt Medved. Well, Adam, Joshua, and Lynn, we got the, the, the full group here today. Very excited to have you guys on. How's everybody doing? Doing good. Hey. Thanks for having us. Doing great. Yeah. Thank you. Definitely. Well, I, I think just to kind of set the stage, I mean, obviously, um, I know Matt and I have spent a lot of time working in music, and I think what inspires us both a lot is, is the impact this will have for the music industry. So we're very excited uh, to see one of really taking this gigantic step forward for NFTs, for the, the music industry as a whole. Um, could you just talk a little bit about the, the inception? Like, how did the idea come together? I know it's obviously evolved quite a bit since that initial phase and still very early in the grand scheme of things, but um, would really love to hear just you guys talk through that, that founding and initial story. Yeah, you know, the founding of the company is, um, you know, I've been working on uh, blockchain technology for about uh, probably six plus years, uh, got together with the uh, Bell Tai, who is one of the earliest VCs in the space. Um, and about two and a half years ago, Bell came to me and was like, you have to take a look at these, these blockchain cats, right? So, uh, so we've been always thinking about the right use case for the music and entertainment industry with blockchain. Um, and, and that, you know, that was kind of a light bulb moment that, you know, what NFT can potentially do for, um, the music industry, everything from, um, you know, music to merch to ticketing, uh, it's, it's just, you know, there, there's a ton of utilities here. Um, so, you know, starting working on kind of early prototypes, um, and, you know, also spoke to the Dapper Labs guys in the earlier day and, and really came to the conclusion, uh, for this to be, uh, scalable, uh, we want to build this on a, uh, you know, a proof of stake, uh, network versus a, a proof of work network. Um, and uh, ended up, um, you know, through kind of serendipitous mutual introductions again through through Bell and his group, 
um, you know, met with the uh, the, the Tezos co-founders and and really kind of share our vision. Uh, and really, eventually, this the Tezos is the right technology basis for what we're trying to build. So, so once you know, once those kind of um, problems and challenges, foundational work is done, I was very excited. I you know, I call immediately call my good friend uh, Josh, um, who who has spent um, you know many many years in both tech and music industry. Um, and Josh can can finish the second half of the story. Yeah, he's team me up this is sort of a internally the famous story calls me up and tells me how excited he is about nfts in like you know five minutes and then i finally get a chance to speak and i go well what are nfts i had no idea what nfts were at the time um i think like a lot of people sort of at the beginning of the end of 2020 you know early 2021 when it sort of entered the public consciousness i was definitely one of those people that was not um an expert in the space at all and so, you know, the quick little background about Lynn and I, Lynn and I have known each other for 15 plus years. I was the best man at Lynn's wedding. We've, uh, you know, extremely close family friends, traveled the world together. We've been in adjacent industries for almost our entire careers, um, but just sort of, you know, never did something together. So this was the first thing that he called me up and I was like, you know what, Lynn, we got to do this. Um, and I got really excited about the idea that, you um, with the Tezos connection, with a bunch of stuff that we'll dive into later in the phone, uh, late, later in the podcast, um, that this was a way to get sort of non-crypto people onto a crypto platform in an easy way that got them excited and fun. And that it wasn't necessarily in their minds about blockchain or crypto. It was about being a fan of music. Um, and, you know, that was the thing that sort of first got me excited about it. Um, and I knew, you know, if we're going to do this project, that there's a third partner that we needed. And, uh, I called up my other good friend of ten plus years, Adam Fell here, and he can uh, he can take it from there. <laughs> yeah, jo- Josh called me, and I basically said the same thing to him. <clears throat> excuse me, that he had said to Lynn, which was, you know, what is an NFT? And I and I'm not uh, proud to say that, um, but the following kind of I guess it's now been about seven months has been a a huge education, but it's also fun to really talk to two music guys. Uh, you guys understand the ramifications that this have for our industry. And those ramifications are enormous, largely because you're not collateralizing any of the existing revenue streams of musicians. This is something brand new, right? You go and do a record deal, you're collateralizing your record royalties. You go and do a publishing deal, you're collateralizing your songwriter royalties. You go and do a tour promotion deal, uh, you're collateralizing your concert royalties. This is a brand new category. And that category is super exciting because artists have simply never had the ability to make this customer offering or fan offering uh, to to their fans. And the fans suddenly have a vehicle through which they get to come along for the ride with the the artist. That is incredibly exciting. It's something that, you know, um, lots of entities have had, but artists haven't had. And so, you know, super, super exciting. But I've been with Quincy for now 18 years, since 2003. And um, started as his receptionist. Uh, together, we we grew a company together where we invested in everything from Spotify to Uber to Wayfair, uh, Clubhouse, Community. Uh, got to see many of the exciting things that have come across our in- industry for a really long time. Working for someone like Quincy is heavily intimidating, right? He's the producer of the best-selling album of all time. He's the producer of the best-selling song of all time. Uh, he has more Grammy nominations than anyone in history. He's won more Grammys than anyone alive. Uh, he's the producer of the best, uh, the highest grossing TV show of the 1990s. He's the, he was the first black man to be nominated for best picture with the color purple with Steven Spielberg. The list goes on and on and on and on and on. And so you can imagine with him, it's like uh, everything you're doing, you're, you're not sure if it's worthy of his attention. Uh, but this one was actually quite easy. And that was simply because he's super passionate about anything that can help artists. And there's no denying that this can really help artists. And maybe more importantly, that it addresses the things that are the concerns of artists about the category. And so, you know, we can go into detail on that. um, But the bottom line is artists are scared of anything that hurts the environment, anything that appears to be a cash grab, anything that's too complicated for their fans. Those three things. Right. And the reality is, um, you know, what got me really excited about what Lynn and Josh brought to us 
was it was addressing those three things and doing so in a way that would empower artists, empower fans, and give artists the ability to use this technology to their benefit. Makes total sense. You know, I think you bring up a really interesting point is, you know, as we look over the past, you know, uh, year or so, six months even, uh, it is, it's been really interesting to see the progression in, in music NFTs, seeing guys like Blau and RAC kind of like leading the early charge and then seeing some of the biggest artists in the world come into the space. Um, what are your thoughts on the current state of, of music NFTs and where do you think they're headed? Because it seems like even though there's been this, you know, there's been a, some really exciting action, we're still only scratching the surface of the potential. For sure. And I'm sure all three of us have different answers to that question. Uh, the one that excites me the most is, is one of the things that, that our company solves. And that is the fact that we can offer uh, the ability for artists to have no gas or minting costs and therefore uh, to sell either expensive or inexpensive NFTs. Uh, and of course, when selling inexpensive NFTs, be able to do so at scale. When you look at the fan base of an artist, some fan bases, sure, you know, uh, you, some, some artists have fan bases that are wealthy. Uh, other fan bases, you know, are, are massive, but they might not have the disposable income to spend tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of dollars on NFTs. And as a result, the ability to sell a million NFTs for $10 is possibly uh, better for some artists than selling one NFT for $10 million, right? Because of the ability to A, engage your fan base, use this technology to communicate with your fan base, right? One of the things that we're doing as a company is opening up a digital vault to the fans. This allows us to be able to drop things and gifts for the fan into, into that vault. And that really excites me because the technology itself, um, it is just like I said previously, not collateralizing any of the existing revenue streams of the artist. Yeah, no, that, that's absolutely amazing. And I think you're um, alluding to some of the other kind of like functionality of, uh, of one of in the platform and marketplace. Can you just kind of set the stage as far as what's kind of like the, the vision and, and mission for one of, and then more tactically, like what the product roadmap and kind of marketplace looks like in the, the coming months, years. And obviously this week too, there's a lot of uh, exciting stuff happening as well. Yeah. So um, I can jump into that. So, you know, the, the main goal, overarching goal really is, um, you know, we see NFTs and especially music NFTs as uh, kind of a, a common share passion point for, you know, tens of millions or hundreds of millions of users, right? So this is something that we think is a is a gateway to uh, to allow a hundred million, um, the next one hundred million users who's who's non crypto native, native, who's not on blockchain, who doesn't have a wallet yet, to really uh, get into the ecosystem and 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 make sure their first experience is something uh, fun and easy, right? So it doesn't have to be. Um, you know, triple like mortgaging a house and triple leveraging on some coin that your friend told you to to buy, right? So, so that's kind of really a scary proposition. Now, NFTs collecting, you know, spending a dollar, spending five dollars on your favorite artist uh, collectible. That's a that's a really easy idea to wrap your your head around. Um, so now, with that that with that as our company main goal, so the product is. Uh, I would say very different than uh, other existing NFT platform. It's not built for kind of, um, you know, crypto technologist. It's built for the average fan. So which means you can sign up, um, you know, do your verification with your phone and email and uh, immediately be able to purchase your first NFT, um, you know, uh, with a credit card. Uh, all under kind of two to three minutes. So that's the goal, right? So, so and, and with the ability to mint out Tezos, which is a super low transactional cost chain, so we can actually afford um, to work with our artists to price an NFT super affordably uh, within kind of the, the, the credit card purchase range, uh, but as well as even giving away free NFTs. So, so kind of on the content side, you know, our first, uh, kind of free collection uh, went live uh, last week, and that was with iHeart um, iHeart Radio Music Festival, right? To celebrate one of the biggest concert every year, and and all the top tier talents that's um, in the in the concert lineup. We actually minted one million free NFTs that we're giving away on the site right now on oneof.com. You can set up a free account and just click every day and receive a free NFT. Um, right, and then if you collect a whole set of these NFTs, it unlocks more 
utilities and allow you to even um, possibly win a flyaway trip to this year's um, concert festival. Um, so, so now the next, uh, the first big um, artist, um, artist focused NFT collection is is one of the biggest artists in the world right now, right? So it'll be uh, Doja Cat, um, and that's dropping this week, um, and uh, and it's done in a way where you know the average fan can come and purchase with credit card. In addition, if you are um, kind of a, a crypto native user. You can purchase with um, certainly Tezos, right? That that's the native currency for 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 the Tezos blockchain where these NFTs are minted. Um, but as well as um, you, you know, with uh, multiple other top um, uh, currency cryptocurrencies, including Bitcoin and Ethereum. Um, so so that's a very fundamental difference for our platform. That's different than um, existing NFT platform, right? Usually, there's only one native uh, cryptocurrency supported. Um, so we are basically, you know, you know, I think this basically will uh, uh, really be kind of one of the most inclusive NFT platforms there is, right? So we care about the uh, the user who don't uh, already know anything about crypto, but we also, you know, made it possible for um, for you know not only the Tezos community but also the Bitcoin and Ethereum community to to participate in a fun way. That's fascinating. Yeah, if I can, Super, if I can please add on to that. You know, one of the things we're trying to solve is sort of the, the barrier to entry problem. Lynn sort of described the technical solutions that we have come up with, but there's also sort of a psychological barrier to entry that a lot of people have. Um, I mean, I, I have a 19-year-old cousin, and I asked her yesterday, did you get your free art, iHeart NFT? She knows everything about what we're doing. And she said, no, I just figured it was too complicated, and I wasn't going to be able to figure out how to do it. NFTs seem so complicated. And I think that's a lot of people have that sort of idea in their head. And so I had her go on the platform and she realized in about 60 seconds, she was able to claim her iHeart NFT. And so, you know, we've solved the technical barrier to entry. I think there is a psychological thing that we're spending a lot of time working on, on marketing and messaging, which is, you know, this is for everybody. This is not just for people that know how to fund a wallet and set things up and spend an hour and a half, you know, onboarding themselves. Um, and so that's something that we're working on pretty hard as well. I love that. And I think um, definitely a big problem creating a lot of friction when it comes to, I mean, we always think about it within the framework of the kind of the purists and the tourists in the, the NFT industry, right? You have the, the purists that are these very crypto native folks. And then and the tourists is kind of uh, really bringing in the, the early majority and some of the more kind of late, the, the later adopters in this process. Um, so love to hear that. Just to, to dive a bit deeper too, I mean, it, it all sounds fantastic and, and very exciting. Two um, slightly more granular questions with regards to the, the marketplace. Like, w- what are the types of NFTs you envision having for different artists? And then also, what does the, the kind of strategy look on a longer term as it pertains to types of artists? I mean, obviously, it's fantastic and super exciting and will definitely create a, a very large kind of cultural relevance and moments with the Doja Cat drop. But I think one thing that's often exciting to us, too, and, and be, um, is how NFTs kind of can bring um, some power back to the, the middle class of artists, right? So certain artists that might not necessarily be able to have as much economic viability and sustainability within the, the, the current economic model and the pennies on the dollar that they're making off every stream. So um, do you see down the road this being a very kind of open marketplace to lots of different artists or how are you looking at, at that? So types of NFTs sure, and, let- and artist landscape. Sorry to interrupt. Yeah, I'll let Adam answer the second part, which I know is uh, he's excited to answer. Uh, the first part about sort of what types of NFTs are, are we doing? You know, there's really three buckets for us. Um, the first is music itself. Now, that could be, you know, older music, the canon of music history turned into collectibles. Um, could be unreleased music. It could be remixes. It could be a cover. So actual recorded music is obviously a sort of category number one. Number two is of experiential things, meeting the artists, going to a special show, um, getting a unique sort of experience where they maybe come and play for you and your friends at your house. If you, you know, get some crazy one of one or some collection that you're the one that's able to form the collection. So uh, experiential stuff. And then the third is kind of um, a lot of what honestly what's mostly been out there sort of in the past that we're trying to add on to, which is sort of art. Um, memorabilia of some kind, you know, digital art, et cetera. So those are the kind of the main three buckets. 
The, the one thing I'll say about that is simply that we encourage artists to do, when it comes to experiential things, we, we encourage artists to do perpetual or semi-perpetual experiences rather than I'll come to your house and play. I'll come to your house once a year and play so that uh, there's resale value and, and use of the actual technology. Um, that's, that's one thing. And then the second thing with regards to the roadmap for the company and how we envision this, yes, there, there is no doubt for me that the technology is maybe more useful for the emerging artist than it is for the superstar artist. Sure, the superstar artist has the ability to go and, and make significant money, um, but the emerging artist has the ability to go to his or her first thousand fans on Instagram and say, you know, essentially buy my rookie card. And, you know, that power is really, really special. Um, so yes, you know, the answer to your question is, you know, we're not quite at the liberty to disclose how we're doing it. Um, but we have a roadmap to making it so that anyone at any level of their career can utilize this technology to empower themselves and their fan bases. Yeah. I mean, I, I'll add that, like, you know, kind of one of our three pillars, right? So so we're um, kind of environmentally friendly. We're um, kind of want to build a platform for every fan. And, you know, the third pillar really is artists first, right? So so it comes in two ways. One is we are supporting, you know, we're, you know, the vision for the platform is to support all uh, different levels of artists. Um, so in the beginning, right, so right now we're kind of in the stage where we're doing curated drops, right? So so we're we're working with a uh, a selective group of artists, um, you know, both major artists and emergent artists, right? So we announced the Emergent Artist Spotlight Program. So we will be kind of even on the curated platform to to showcase, um, you know, smaller up-and-coming artists, but, but also, you know, kind of the goal uh, and the vision is always, you know, this is a... a, a a technology tool that any artist can use and mint um, anything related to their works, right? So, so that's something we are striving towards. Um, so, so there will be, you know, kind of uh, self-service capabilities uh, released in the future. Um, but you know, also, you know, I think a part of the um, the goal, and you know, when we see, we think it's our responsibility is also education, right? Education and onboarding of artists into the ecosystem. Um, I would say most artists up to this point, um, you know, know a little bit about NFTs, right? So I think most of them are also kind of uh, who had done drops before, maybe are not so honest about that. They only know a little bit of NFT or they don't know that much about NFTs. So we are kind of working with artists that like, hey, you know, I think a lot of the um, these honest conversations with artists are like, they're like, you know, hey, we don't know a lot about this. We know our fans really love this. We want to learn and we want to get into the space and we want to do something our fans will appreciate. Um, so that's very important, right? So that is something that, you know, I think some of the earlier drops from other bigger names on other platforms, you know, some done well and some didn't do so well. And, and you know, I think um, a lot of it is is, is how... Um, um, you know, how honest the artists are and how authentic uh, the project is to their core, right? So we're basically now designing and educating and having those conversations with artists. And a lot of artists are that we're working with are, you know, very curious, but like don't know a lot about NFTs. And we're, we're doing, um, you know, we're working with them to, to um, you know, be, just because like the, um, the you know, when artists really truly understand the power what NFT can be for for their career going forward, uh, that's when we see like kind of in the middle of our conversation these sparks start to fly, right? And amazing collection and collaboration start to happen. For sure, for sure. And you know, Adam, I love that you brought up you know the idea of like the one thousand fans, you know, like the one thousand true fans concept that uh, Kim Kelly like advances something that I'm you know I'm a, I'm a big fan of, and I think it it really gets gets kind of strikes to the heart of the idea that. Uh, NFTs can kind of like actualize like the the initial promise of the internet, which was allowing any creator to really directly connect with their fans and be able to you know not and not have to have millions to to be able to to create a sustainable career. Um, and, and you know I, I think that part of part of you know what 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 uh, he talks about in that is you know all these sort of centralized bodies that got in the way of of um, being able to sort of uh, you know directly connect with those fans. 
but obviously those centralized bodies are also a reality in the, in the music industry as well. So, you know, I, I'm curious to hear your thoughts on how you plan to partner with rights holders in the music industry and, and sort of uh, navigate that, that web of, you know, major labels, publishers, et cetera, because uh, it's, it's quite straightforward when you're working with independent artists, but obviously it gets a bit more complicated um, when working with, with artists where there are all these this sort of like nebulous web of, of different um, rights holders. So just curious to hear a bit more about the strategy and, and plans for partnerships there. Yeah, I mean, the bottom line is we're not, we don't discriminate in any way, shape, or form, right? We, we want to work with great IP. And sometimes that great IP, if you look at the canon of music history, much of it is owned by the major labels. We'd be shooting ourselves in the foot if we weren't trying to work with the major labels. Um, and that goes for many of the artists who have you know recording rights and other rights, sometimes even la- name and likeness tied up in their deals, right? We don't want to, to basically say to those artists, oh, too bad. You know, you, you did this deal 10 years ago, but uh, that means we can't work with you, right? Like we, we want to actually be inclusive and, and allow artists at every level, even if they've made a bad deal in the past. So this involves obviously multiple rights holders, right? It involves if you're releasing music specifically, it involves the label, it involves the publisher. Uh, sometimes it involves the societies from the perspective of the deals we have to do uh, as, as, as a company, as a platform. And, you know, we're trying to get all of those things done. Uh, Sure, there is the ability to work with the independent artist that has all of his or her master rights, his or her publishing, uh, hasn't, you know, done any deals worldwide and can sell worldwide to the fans and do whatever he or she wants. And I think that's empowering, sure. But we as a platform want to give that right to everybody. And, you know, I, I look at, you know, my business partner, Quincy Jones, right? This guy has credits on over 4,000 songs through the course of his career. Some of that, those songs are owned by Mercury Records. Some of those re- songs are owned by a and Records. Some of those songs are owned by Sony and Epic, uh, the work he did with Michael Jackson, right? Um, some of those are owned by Warner, the, the work he did with Frank Sinatra, right? And the reality is all of those things have compelling NFT uh, propositions, Right, or they're very exciting to be thought about as NFTs. Uh, and so, if we weren't working with the labels, the right holders, I would be precluding someone like you know my own business partner from being able to utilize the technology. So, yeah, I mean, the the, the bottom line is we want to work with any IP that's great, uh, whether that's with an independent creator or with a major major label. Yeah, you know, this is I spoke about barriers earlier. This is a barrier to entry for music NFTs, which is the reason to date you haven't seen, you guys probably know this, a lot of music itself in NFTs is the rights issues is a can of worms that is incredible to to wade through. I mean, if you had you can have a you know a hip hop song with nine writers, which might be nine different publishers. Um, and then you have to do a deal with nine different publishing companies. And now there are, Adam could probably tell you better than me, 57 territories around the world. What if the person that buys the NFT is in, you know, Mexico versus France versus Spain versus wherever. So it, um, it, it, it it's crazy. Yeah. You know, because music is such a, you know, I call it the most collaborative forms of art, right? So doing a, um, you know, music based NFT is very different than doing you know, like a visual art based NFT. So, so, so that is why kind of, you know, I spend kind of two to three years working on this platform. Um, so, cause, cause the actual uh, capabilities and, and back end platform functionality is, is very different than just, you know, putting up a, a, a basic art NFT trading platform. Um, so, so I think that that's what um, a lot of other platforms don't realize, right? You know, first of all, like, you know, maybe 49 other companies pivoted their business model like three months ago or all became an NFT platform, but, but intricacies of how to um, manage like, you know, rights and, and, and also just, you know, fairly compensate all the rights holders, right? Like, that guy that, you know, the producer or the, the, the guy that laid down the drum beats uh, has uh, a stake in this creative work, uh, which a lot of other platforms right now are basically putting the responsibility on the artist to say like, hey, when you give it this work, you're saying we're going to just pay the artist and, and you're saying, you know, everything is, is cool, which, you know, sometimes is, but, but most times it is not, right? So, so that puts the artist in a very precarious um you know financial and and legal 
position um, to to do that. So so we want to. I mean, we basically take on the responsibility of like um, you know trying to make sure um, the the works, whether it's art or music, is um, kind of um, cleared. Uh, with all the rights holders um and 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 you know because kind of the being a music platform is uh, is our primary kind of focus yeah no i, I love it and i'm sure your uh, legal team you're keeping those guys all super busy but uh grateful to see that you are really being very intentional in, in partnering and really just trying to lead with what's uh interesting and awesome ip from kind of the catalog and, and old stuff into to new stuff and even working with more emerging artists so i'm um, really excited to see all this come together as it comes together curious as to where you see the um like NFTs fitting into, you mentioned that it's not necessarily, it's kind of creating a new category of like revenue and engagement with fans. Flat, fast forward three, five years from now, as, as NFTs continue to mature, do you envision NFTs becoming one of the primary revenue streams for artists? Yeah, I mean, I think it certainly can be, right? Um, and the be- beautiful part of this is uh, it can be the largest um part of your revenue mix without cannibalizing any other existing revenue mixes um so so that's what's really exciting about this uh, right so your your 1000 true fan will pay a premium for an you know to show appreciation for your work um and nfts is is not just linear right it's not just a piece of file nfts can actually unlock uh, both digital and real world experiences. You can't really say that about any other revenue stream you have. Like your streaming file or your like concert ticket does not really unlock easily any other um, access or experiences. Just because NFT is so versatile, um, you know. So we certainly think uh, for music art, it's it's it, it will be the majority. It could be the majority of your uh, revenue mix. No, that makes total sense. Um, well, I know that you have uh, a big collaboration in the works around the launch. Uh, tell us a bit about this iHeartRadio Music Festival NFT collab. How did you end up partnering with Corey Van Lu on it, and, and how did it all come together? Yeah, so, um, you know, we re- we're really excited to, like, you know, we've, we've been thinking about the idea of how to get NFTs in the hands of the average fans, right? And then, you know, who better than um, kind of one of the biggest um, you know, audio media companies in the U.S. Uh, to collaborate on the first collection. Um, you know, I would say like we basically in the creative sessions were were very ambitious in the scope. Um, and you know, right down the wire when we're actually executing, we're like, wow, nobody has ever minted a million NFTs in one night, right? We we stayed up and we did everything one night before the collection went went live, and it was it was no simple task. Um, you know, because of the technology and, and how we built on a Tezos platform, um, that literally, you know, and, and how low the transaction cost is, minting a million NFT was was costing us like a fraction, right, of, of what it would have been on other platforms. Um, and, and we wanted to, we decided to give uh, the first 1 million um, tokens away for free, right? So user have enough kind of hesitations about, is this too complicated? Is this going to cost money? Um, right. And so, so we basically remove all those uncertainties. You just basically come onto one of.com, um, click a claim free, um, button and every day you can claim a free NFT. The first drop is basically made up of, um, 16 different uniquely designed, um, poker chips. So the iHeart radio music festival uh, is usually held in Las Vegas. It's held in Las Vegas this year. Um, and the poker trip basically is is the logo. Um, so it's a it, you know it's a three D animated poker trips. It comes in four different suits and comes in different uh, set of lineups based on if it's um, you know uh, night one of the festival, night two of the festival, it's the daytime stage is is you know both nights of the festival. So there's sixteen different combinations. Um, you can collect you know any one of them, um, and uh, they come in different rarities, right? So they come in the green tier, which is our most um, the affordable tier and, and even free um, it comes in a gold tier. Some of the items and some of the items comes in the platinum tier. Kind of taking a page out of the uh, how how music records are are awarded out. Um, so so if you collect a, a you know let's say um, the 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 suit of heart of all uh, four different lineup combinations, 
uh, you get bonus entries and you're guaranteed uh, to be able to, um, you know, basically receive a NFT art uh, that is designed by Corey Van Lu. So Corey Van Lu, if you guys, uh, for the people that don't know who Corey is, uh, Corey done, uh, you know, amazing crypto artist, recently did a Mike Tyson drop that basically, um, you know, sold out a uh, super crypt for like three plus million dollars. Uh, Corey has a really unique kind of color style and, and color palette that, that we really loved. Um, so, so we basically, you know, um, had a, this discussion with Corey. He's really into what we're doing and our mission, right? So, so there's three pieces of work, uh, that he is creating that really is, um, kind of encapsulate the three pillars of what one of is about, right? It's about the fans, it's about the artists, it's about the environment. Um, you know, minting on Tezos blockchain also means we are two million times more energy efficient um, than other NFT um, networks. So, so, so basically, takes the um, average um, the en energy that that basically on other networks of using proof of work, it, it takes the energy of like you know five plus days. Of that powers a U.S. household just to mint an NFT now, um, you know it, it it takes the energy of sending out a tweet to mint it on our platform. Um, so 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 now like to be able to collect a uh, Corey Van Lu, um, you know, crypto art is 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 just a, a su super exciting opportunity in general. So you can do that for free. Right. So we make we allow you to do that for free if you just collect uh, a set of four poker chips. Um, and then every poker chip you collect, you can also basically um, you know, enter, you know, that's your your chance to win a flyaway experience to um to the iHeart Radio Festival this year. Um, and then additional pieces for Corey Van Lu will be digitally signed by the performing artists from the festival. Uh, so there's a drop three coming uh, in the collection that basically for for the autograph pieces you can actually uh, you know purchase and 100 percent uh, of the proceeds will be donated to uh, the uh, uh, right here right now global climate uh, alliance right so so it's a it's a very well thought out collection that involves um you know one of the platform, um, I heard the, the the festival producers as, as well as um, you know a, you know one of the hottest crypto artists today. So we're really excited about that collection. That's fascinating, and um, now big fans of Corey and Corey's work, past podcast guests, and just seeing all the the progress there. So it's great to see how you guys are really kind of uh, finding ways to really engage with a lot of the people that have built up a lot of uh, community in the space so far, and excited to see it continue to to evolve. In that same vein, too, I mean, I know you got the, the Doja Cat drop coming up. would be very curious when you think uh, just as far as the dynamics of that drop and, and what's involved there. I know, obviously, she's a true global superstar. Um, so what, what exactly is the drop there? And then when you think it further on, what are some of the other sorts of drops or use cases that, that really excite you most as you look forward to the kind of the curated strategy of doing drop drop in the, the near future? Yeah, so we're, I mean, I, I'm most excited about just you know the the we have a great creative team we also would work with um, multiple creative agencies outside the company as well so so kind of the drop ideas are always not just about um you know what happens right now in this drop it always has a a, a arc a continuity and utility that opens up uh future experiences right right whether it's kind of more digital experiences or, or physical experiences. So, so Doja Cat were really kind of um, thinking through how to connect the digital with the physical world. Um, so so the, the, the collection, the first collection for Genesis collection is gonna be called um, Planet Doja, which is um, you know, a take on her uh, best-selling album right now, Plan to Her. Um, and um, the idea is you, know, you are the founding members of, um, of, of Planet Doja. Right, so it's a very it's a limited item collection. Uh, it's far, you know, far less. The first collection was uh, we did on the platform with iHeart was a million tokens. Um, this collection really uh, only about twenty thousand tokens. Right, so it's very few people, and and she has you know I think sixty million fans uh, that listen to her music in the in the last thirty days. Well, twenty thousand um, so, would be to interrupt you, Lynn. Sorry, twenty thousand would be not a lot for our platform. For almost every other platform in the world, twenty thousand tokens would be the largest drop they've probably ever done. So, 
Right. Um, ahead, right. So, you know, so, so, you know, but they're priced super affordably. They're token that starts at as low as $5, right? So there's, there's really seven different tokens um, in different tiers. So, so there are gold tokens, uh, platinum tokens, and, and uh, you know, there's going to be our first one of one also. Um, so now the first, uh, there, there are three tokens that's basically inspired by the flowers of um, Planet Dojo, which and, and her kind of um, home, you know uh, where she's from, um, South Africa lineage. Um, so so those flower tokens uh, you can collect, and each each token will will comes with uh, a chance for uh, one or more uh, golden tickets to her next tour. Um, and uh, the next tier is the elemental tokens, right? So so there are two. Uh, there are three elemental tokens. There's the wind, the the water, the fire. Uh, each token kind of comes with um, chances for VIP experiences at her tour, right? Um, and and the fire token is it, which which is a um, a diamond tier token comes with guaranteed VIP experiences at her next tour. Um, now, what's really uh, cool uh, is any of the tokens, right? That um, that you you collect. Uh, we basically uh, will allow you to fuse three tokens, three different types of tokens together. And that this will generate a new higher tier token in the next draw. Um, so, so that's something really cool and, and really no other platform and no other collection has done that, right? So it's kind of the burn and scarcity mechanics uh, that really, you know, we have a little bit for, for kind of the true uh, crypto heads that, that want to calculate like, you know, now what is the, uh, scarcity equation when some of these tokens are are being fused in the future. Um, but for the average fan, you can just come and collect one or more. I mean, they they're priced really between five up to a hundred dollars for 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 most of the collection, right? Um, and then for the true true fan, there is uh, this is well, we're going to be dropping the first one of one. So there is a one of tier uh, in most of our collections. Um, that would be super important because this is the first ever uh, one of one dropped on the one of platform in general. So this doesn't uh, not only this unlocks Doja Cat experiences, uh, it, it unlocks a true utility for the one of platform. So so the holder of our first one of one, um, right, which is the Doja Cat uh, one of one, will be able to receive a free gold token for every gold token we mint for our curated artist drops forever, right? It comes with a free go tier um, token from every drop we ever do from now until end of time. Um, they'll, so, automatically so, receive. Right, automatically they'll automatically receive. They'll automatically receive. Um, it's possible so, so, that we're gonna regret this one, but we'll see. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so so this is basically is uh, also another fun idea to, you know, uh, not only you can be a Do Doja fan, this is part of kind of our idea of how we want to reward the early adopters of the one of community. So, so much of business and life is about timing, as you guys know. Um, I don't think that when we did this deal, um, well, for, let me go back in time a, a tiny bit. Our company, Quincy Jones Productions, has the honor of managing Yeti Beats. Uh, Yeti is Doja's chief collaborator. Um, you know, he's, he started working with her when she was only 17 years old. He executive produced all of her albums, including uh, Planet Her. And if you look at the top four songs, top four most streamed songs on uh, the current album, he produced three of them. Um, so he's still very, very much, you know, uh, kind of working in the trenches with her. And, you know, we were lucky enough to be introduced to her by him. But when we were introduced to her, you know, this, this album hadn't even come out and this album came out 10 weeks ago. It was, it's not like this came out like two weeks ago. And yet it was the number one most streamed album on Spotify globally last week. Um, which is just remarkable to me, right? 10 weeks after release, this, the stability of her streaming audience is just insane. And on top of that, uh, for the last, I think it's 16 straight days, she's been the most streamed female on the entire Spotify platform. Um, this is a brand new thing, right? Last 16, 17 days. And so we feel like our timing is good. Um, we feel like this is an enormous opportunity for us to bring significant amounts of fans 
uh, into this world and, you know, to bring them and get them interested in NFTs. Makes total sense. Makes total sense. You know, I, I'd love to chat a bit about, you know, the decision to, to go with the Tezos blockchain. I know you mentioned it was, mo- it was motivated by, um, you know, environmental concerns and also, um, you know, wanted to be with um, proof of stake. You know, I, I think it's interesting because, you know, there's, there's a bit of, you know, misunderstanding around sort of like the environmental impact of NFTs in general in terms of like, you know, judging it by like a, like a, like a carbon footprint per transaction when like those blocks are going to be processed no matter what. Um, but certainly, you know, it, it is interesting looking at like the current state of Ethereum, um, which is transitioning to proof of stake. And then some of these uh, you know, like blockchains like Tezos, which are, are popping up and, 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 you know, can, you know, are, are using less energy in the aggregate. Um, and so I'm, I'm curious to hear your thoughts on like what, why Tezos was like the right choice and, and also, um, you know, uh, sort of addressing those, those environmental concerns. Um, and, and as, as, Ethereum, as Ethereum moves towards like proof of stake, is that something that you would think about um, in the future? Yeah, I mean, I think, like, first of all, we love the fact Ethereum is, uh, you know, working towards proof of stake, right? So, um, you know, the decision process for for me was, you know, kind of two and a half years ago, we were looking at uh, proof of stake options, and there weren't really any um, kind of um, stable ones, right? So there were a lot of white paper uh, in 2017, and Tezos was one of the earliest ones uh, in the space, and 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 they were one of the earliest ones to deploy their mainnet. Um, so 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 that's a uh, you know a huge plus for us. Um, Adam can get get into a little bit more how like you know the the feedback we we got from artists when once we sh- share with them what the you know how environmentally or how low energy consumption Tezos is. Uh, and and the low transaction fee is a is a huge decision factor for us. Um, the the biggest kind of secret weapon we think Tezos have is this like self amending capability. It's the only blockchain that can upgrade the entire blockchain uh, once it reaches eighty percent consensus. So it can upgrade without a hard fork. Uh, a hard fork is kind of problematic for every blockchain that basically splits the community in two, right? So um, it, and and also like just on the NFT use case, like you're supposed to have this like unique, unduplicatable um, token. After a hard fork, it kind of becomes two tokens, right? So, um, so, so we just didn't think that made any sense. And and Tezos was uh, had this capability of always learning from the latest, best, um, you know, ideas in the NFT space, and and always upgrade and and be kind of future proof, right? So, Flow is another blockchain that. Uh, came up with a lot of great concepts and and Tezos in kind of the um you know its fifth and sixth upgrade kind of took um some of the great experience like learning experiences that that flow went through um so so it is kind of always uh we think uh, at the forefront uh of kind of nft technology yeah the self amending thing just to add on to that um is very important to the rights holders in the music space going back to of the rights holders comments the ability to uh protect the resale royalty over time um is something that has really resonated with the record labels with most of the rights holders um the idea that we can eventually patch sort of holes and security issues as we go on um rather than having to do a hard fork every time is something that was meaningful to a lot of the rights holders and then going back to what Lynn, you know, said, I could speak to with regards to the rights holders and their concerns, right? Um, multiple of the artists that we've announced on our platform had already announced doing NFTs, uh, you know, with with our competitors, and the blowback that they received from their own audiences was significant enough that they canceled those drops, and that had to do with energy consumption. Um, you know, we can all easily Google uh, the energy consumption of other blockchains right now. Uh, it had to do with, you know, that that cash grab and therefore the mi- high minting and gas costs, which precluded, um, you know, basically fans from participating unless they had a certain wealth level. Uh, and, and, you know, the reality is, right, the, the stats that Lynn gave earlier about, you know, us being, you know, Tezos being 2 million times more energy efficient than uh, so many of the leading platforms. This is stuff that really resonated with artists, right? Because they want to be able to say with a clean conscience, yeah, you know, this NFT that you're buying, it used less electricity than a tweet uh, to be minted. And as, as we joke about all the time, 
when you can do that, you're not allowed to get Twitter blowback because <laughs> every complaint is more energy than the NFT that you're buying. So um, we love that fact. Um, it's really resonated. As a result, we've been able to sign up you know, many of the biggest artists in the world. Her, the Whitney Houston estate. Obviously, we're talking about Doja Cat this week. But Quincy Jones, this resonated with him, of course. Jacob Collier, g Easy, TLC, Charlie Puth, Alesso, Aurora, and the Kid Leroy. Um, you know, the Kid Leroy is a, a really interesting one because he's had the number one song in the country for the last four weeks. Really. Um, so, you know, we have the biggest females in the world, uh, Kid Leroy, the biggest artist in the world. Um, we, we were really hoping that this can get a lot of fans on the platform and, you know, a lot of people interested in NFTs. Yeah, to, to Adam's point, Matt, you know, you bring up a good point. A lot of the energy consumption discussion, you can go down a rabbit hole of semantics with a lot of people about it, and it can be extremely complicated. But you know, the reality is, that aside, the perception for artists um, that are not, you know, necessarily blockchain experts, you know, it, it, it is important to them. And, you know, that's a lot of what Adam sort of spoke to. There definitely is the perception that NFTs are bad for the environment. Um, and it's something that our artists have had to address. Sure, sure. One, one thing that I, I, think, I think you make a good point there, um, you know, whether this perception is, is real or not, the perception itself is real. And that's something that artists have to deal with. And, and I know, uh, you know, just from my own context in the music industry, uh, also artists who have, you know, canceled drops or had to change their plans, you know, um, because of the uh, perceived backlash. Um, one thing I'd love to get your thoughts on, too, is, you know, uh, OpenSea just recently announced cross-chain support, and I believe Tezos is, is included on there. And, and I'd love to hear your thoughts about what that, uh, what that does from a secondary market dynamic uh, in terms of uh, the drops on your platform. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, we love that, right? So, you know, I think the biggest um, kind of secondary market um, place is uh, also saw what we saw is um, the Tezos kind of NFT ecosystem is booming. Um, you know, um, the Tezos already right now have like the second or the third largest uh, kind of NFT trading platform already. Um, and, and you know, with our platform going live and a lot of work Tezos doing kind of in the, on the, sports side um and, and and you know they're great generative art project that kind of just launched on tezos and it's doing great in its first week uh we think this is kind of a turning point right for just awareness tezos is kind of like the little bit of an underdog and and less known blockchain for nfts even though you know kind of kind of being hands-on working on this for for two plus years uh we know the the potential here uh so so you know we think um more and more marketplace will certainly adopt uh kind of tezos as a um a, a, as one of the um kind of uh chains where, where nfts can be traded and uh, it just gives more liquidity to nfts we mint uh, we will be offering a super easy to use like one click secondary marketplace as well right so uh, so basically within 24 hours after the doja cat drop our secondary marketplace will open. Um, this is an ex exclusive NFT now exclusive. We're not talking about this anywhere else yet. Um, so all the user have to do is, you know, purchase an NFT with a credit card and then just click a button, right? So that post for sale and you can pick your own price. You don't have to think in terms of how many ETH this is and you just pick a USD price. Uh, and it's now immediately available for other users to purchase uh, with a credit card or, or with any of the crypto we support. So, um, so it's a super easy, fun way to kind of, um, you know, uh, trade with other members of the one of community, um, and then, you know, complete a collection, um, you know, because every collection we build, there is kind of combination and, and burn and fuse, um, mechanics, right. So you unlock more experiences and when you are actually complete a collection, uh, there's a lot of fun things you can do with this. So we think a lot of the, um, you know, our secondary marketplace will probably, you know, still be the largest secondary marketplace for, to 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 trade NFTs. But it's great that um, you know other marketplaces will be supporting Tezo. So so kind of uh, the roadmap is uh, within about thirty days, you'll be able to export uh, your NFTs from our custodial wallet to your own wallet, and then you know you, you you're free to kind of trade them uh, with us or or with another platform. 
love it. No, super exciting. Um, well, as we come to a close, I want to just kind of do a rapid fire question down the line. Um, what, I mean, obviously there's a lot of power is being brought back to, to artists and their fans, right? I think the, the early fans are now able to kind of uh, participate in this journey and, and see a little bit of a appreciation potentially with the upside and also just express their fandom in a new form. Um, and then the, the artists too, right? This is a completely new category to actually kind of build more economic viability for their model. So what inspires each of you guys or excites you the most around how NFTs help musicians and their fans? We'll go Lynn, Josh, and Adam. Um, yeah, so I think the the biggest way is, you know, we think this allows your uh, your work to not be commoditized, right? So so selling your your, your music for a dollar versus, you know, your true fans paying, you know, a thousand dollars for for your work. This is opens up, um, you know, like we said earlier, allows artists to basically um, um, make a career or, or make a living um, out of a uh, much smaller uh, group of artists. And, and you know, uh, and this is a huge equalizer. Yeah, I think it, you know, it forms a direct relationship between the fan and the artist in a way that um, has never really happened before. The whole history of the music business is sort of a barrier. You have a record label and then you have, in the old days, a Tower Records and then you have the fan. So you have the artists with two buffers in between. And now you sort of still historically have had a buffer, whether it's Spotify, the record label, Apple Music and the record label. And now, you know, there's a direct connection between the artist and the fan. Um, and, you know, we talked about the digital vault that we have earlier, which is really a way for the artist to communicate directly with the fan in a way that we're pretty excited about. So what, what I'd say the thing that I'm most excited about is just, uh, you know, when you, when you look at how the early artist has been able to make a living for the last mm, five, 10 years, right? So much of what's played into that are these incredible crowdsourcing platforms, right? And they allow artists to basically sell everything from experiences to signed vinyl to whatever uh, to members. And, you know, this is almost like the next generation of that. It's a collectible uh, that you sell and your artist gets to, to be a part of it. And then, you know, as, as Lynn was saying, in, in the, when the resale market opens, you know, these, these fans get to basically be a part of the artist's career. And I just love the idea that these can finance everything from music videos to set design of tours uh, to so much more for these, for these artists. Um, and if you get creative and utilize the, the, the resale and the perpetuity of the technology to your advantage, you can, there's just a million combinations of how you make this fun and exciting, right? You think of gamification and, you know, sets that you create and the fifth of the set, you have to play a video game to, to, to win the fifth NFT to complete the set. But the video game proves that you're the biggest, you know, fan of that artist. Um, there's just a, a million possibilities. And I think that's the thing I'm most excited about is just the unending possibilities of what artists can do and utilize their creativity in a new way and frankly, you know, benefit. Yeah. No, I'm very exciting indeed. And definitely want to thank you guys uh, not only for coming on today, but I think this definitely is uh, on behalf of music fans and musicians. I think these uh, contributions are going to make a grand impact within the industry for all who are involved. So uh, really appreciate you guys for all the work you're doing and thanks for taking the time to uh, come talk with us today. Thanks, Thanks for having us. This Thank was fun. Thanks, guys. Man, well, really enjoyed that episode. I think one of is doing incredible work to uplift the music community as a whole and really find interesting ways to innovate on the experience of what it means to be an artist and a fan, right? I think they're um, proceeding in all the right ways, partnering with amazing artists, but also looking to make it very accessible both for artists and for fans. I think it's going to be incredibly exciting as the NFT market matures and, and we really do see NFTs start to empower artists on a, on a much grander scale by becoming one of the primary revenue streams in the, the kind of repertoire of sorts. So really appreciated hearing what they have to say. Definitely go to oneof.com to, to check out the marketplace, see what drops are available. Go check out the Doja Cat drop. Um, and as always, really appreciate you all tuning in. If you haven't already, do be sure to go to nftnow.com where you can subscribe to our weekly newsletter. 
And, uh, and that's that for this week. We'll be back next week. Until then, we're out.